does the ought of God's law imply can? Hi, my name is Ted Rosenblatt, and I'm here with my father, Dr. Rod Rosenblatt. Dad, it seems like uh, the way some of God's word speaks, like uh, we were reading John, uh, that we should be able to do these things. Yeah, First John. That's, that's some tough language. Yep. Seems like John is implying, in this case, that we should be able to, to it's how do it, the things that the law says, and we should be able to be like Christ and walk like Christ. Mm-hmm. And that's how it reads. <clears throat> it's also a conversation in philosophical circles. Uh, the name is Kant, and people can, if you're in some uh, philosophy class, you'll run into that. The plain answer is simple. No, no. Um, in so many ways, we imagine that the answer is yes. That is, if I comprehend what I ought to do, then I can do it. And the answer, given the Christian doctrine of original sin, is, oh, really? You imagine that? You haven't learned in life yet? That that collapses right underneath you like a hangman's uh, well gallows. But if you think about what I think, I think both to inside and outside the church, the way the teachings can be often uh, perceived and uh, just often are, is is as though these things are spoken of. In this case, in John. As, as an imperative, it is something that we should, we really need to be doing because we can be doing them. Uh, it, se- it seems pretty clear yeah. to the average layman to yeah. read that and say, well, gee, what kind of Christian am I? Because it says I, sh- you know, I should be doing this. Right. But I'm not. I'm, look how wicked I was this week. Right. Uh, <clears throat> we've dealt with before a classic paragraph, the end of Romans 7, where, by the way, Paul is writing as a Christian believer. This is not before he came to know the Lord. And that those chilling lines, the good that I want to do, I'm never doing. That which I hate and don't want to be doing, I'm always doing. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? That's Paul as a believer. So it ought not be strange to us if we fight the same fight and are always losing. And what this comes down to is just driving us again to, do we really believe in what the Bible says about the depth of sin? And even for the Christian believer, that's still operating. Um, It is suicidal to sit under teaching that says you ought to be able to eliminate this and quickly. Terribly naive. So this very convicting you know, to we sinners, right? This is, uh, this is not good news. It's what, what is the best, if that is the not, if the reading is not what we see on the face yes. of First John, what then should we take away that would, um, that would hold us up? What would be the good news to us? Well, it's even in First John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And what he writes about Christ being our advocate in the sense of our defense lawyer, that he will, on the basis of his death and resurrection, defend us from all of it. We will not be condemned at the judgment that we failed so often in these imperatives. His death and resurrection is what he substituted for us in his life and in his death, and that's counted to us by simple faith in him. So I'll, I'll ask a simple question uh, for the, you know, the layman in our audience. Is this somewhat legalistic language, but is this where the phrase imputed righteousness can Absolutely. come into play? Absolutely. The imputed righteousness is completely enough to save. The, the righteousness that isn't in you but was in him that's reckoned to us is completely enough to save. So when I wake up every morning as a Christian and I am finding myself haunted by wicked thoughts and I'm not focusing on what I should and I'm not, I, I know that I'm failing here and I'm failing there and I'm, what is this, what does that mean to me in my daily life? Be a good cheer. It'll never be counted against you. 
So what is the thing that is counted for me? Christ's righteousness is counted for you. If I'm hit by a truck later that afternoon, yep. and I know I've been a wicked sinner all morning and I haven't had a chance to repent yet. Yep. It's not like a bank transaction. You're in him. So what is the thing that I can look to then? You know, what is, what is the thing? I, I've heard it said, I'll make it simple. I've heard it said by enough pastors that, uh, you know, the, the constant recurring theme that you're going to see here and in other places is remember your baptism. Yeah. From the Lutheran perspective. Yeah, from a Lutheran perspective, remember you were baptized. Christ and his benefits were given to you by simple tap water and the promise. And that is sufficient. Yeah, that's sufficient. In other words, it keeps us from being paralyzed when we are conscious of our sin daily. So the imperatives in a text like 1 John are met by Christ and then those, the meeting of the, the perfection of that is then given to us. Yeah. Reckon to us as if ours. All right. We're going to wrap it. Try to keep it short and sweet. It's tough to pack this, this kind of thing into such a short time. Hope you enjoyed this and hope to come back. you come back and we see you soon. Thank you for joining us on Talks with Dad Rod, part of the 1517 Podcast Network. This podcast and all 1517's content is made possible through financial support by listeners just like you. Please visit 1517.org for more, and please consider clicking on the donate button and making a recurring or one-time contribution to help us share this good news in a world which so desperately needs it. <laughs>